Dr. Marie Augermath. She completed PhD in ecology at University of Alberta in 2014. Prior to that, I did a MSc in biology at Dalhousie, uh, 2008, and BSc in marine biology, also Dalhousie, 2005. <clears throat> Since September of 2017, <clears throat> Marie's been an assistant professor at UBC um, with joint appointment in Department of Statistics and the Institute. Institute Oceans and Fisheries. And she's also a Canada Research Chair in Statistical Ecology. Uh, she co collaborates in a lot of field work and data analysis in, on the ecology of large charismatic megafauna, uh, much of that in the Arctic, and uh, pretty exciting creatures like polar bears, narwhals, pilot whales, um, and so on, even fish and birds. And uh, she's contributed to a lot of papers uh, uh, with really innovative statistical modeling approaches to making inferences on animal movements, habit, habitat use, and other things. So with that, I'll put it over to Marie. Okay, thank you, Murdoch, for the uh, invitation and the introduction. Uh, and it's a, a real pleasure to be able to, to present um, some of my work. Um, I think I may be a tiny little bit of an oddity in this seminar series in that, although I work a little bit on, on fisheries, um, most of my work is really developing statistical model for animal movement um, rather than population dynamics or, or stock assessment. And um, and I work, as, as Murdoch mentioned, I work on, on a lot of non on fish species, but I have included some fish example just to, to keep the fisheries uh, a line of, of, of research. And, and today I'll talk about uh, one type of model that I, I use a lot and I developed a lot, which is a, a state space models. And I'll talk about them in the context of animal movement, but these are models that are used a lot in fishery science. Uh, I think many of you uh, might even use them in their, your own research. And I, I hope that some of the ideas that I, that I bring may still may be useful, whatever, um, whatever kind of specific research that you're doing. Um, so before I kind of jump into the stats, I'll talk a little bit about what motivate my work. And a lot of my work is motivated by conservation. So I'll, I'll start there. So, I mean, this is a, an audience of people that are well aware of this, but oceans provide us many goods and services. Um, they provide us food in the form of fish, crustacean, uh, mollusk, even algae. They provide us enjoyment, whether it's spending a day at the beach or, you know, diving or whale watching. As human, we really seek to be close to the ocean. Um, it, they're important transport routes. Uh, they allows us to get our food or cars or toys, et cetera, et cetera. And the ocean provides us energy, whether it's in form of oil and gas or more renewable um, alternatives. Um, and because of this, ocean provides us jobs. They're important for us econom economically, um, socially, and culturally. But with a lot of these activities tend to affect a broad range of species through kind of a variety of different ways. So of course, direct catch uh, can really affect a species, the targeted species in particular. And so for example, uh, whaling has brought uh, many whale species to the brink of extension. But despite the fact that now there's a general moratorium on, on whaling, a lot of whale species are not recovering as much as we would expect. And that's because many of the human activities that I just talked about impact animals in different ways. So for example, fisheries can impact other species through, you know, uh, bycatch, entanglement, food competition, and um, tourism industry can really bring disturbance. So for whales, they might have a boat kind of riding their tail all the time, but also like diving, kind of poking at reefs and destroying reefs, etc., kind of bring disturbance. Um, shipping is associated with things like ship strike and things like, um, um, oil and gas industry is uh, associated with um, with disturbances of in particular noise disturbances. So a lot of species rely on sound um, to, to see their environment and, and these industries tend to kind of disturb them. Um, and then of course, all of these human activities have kind of indirect impact in the form of like contributing to climate change or through pollution, et cetera, which can also affect a broad range of species. And because of this, I mean, we're increasingly recognizing as, as individual, as industry, as government, that we need to have, you know, conservation action if we want to, you know, use the ocean, but uh, conserve the species that live within it. <clears throat> 
And the key point for me, um, and I leave kind of the key point driving a lot of my research, is that a lot of the current conservation measures are spatial in, in nature. So for example, the Species at Risk Act in Canada says that if a species is listed as endangered, we need to protect its critical habitat. So clearly, one of the important things to do for an endangered species is identifying what is its critical habitat so we can protect it. And the ways to protect this is through, say, things like protected areas. And there's been a, a recent push and global push to protect 10% of, um, of marine, uh, of oceans, but um, to reach these key target. And then there's tons of other different ways that are maybe less conservation focused and more multidisciplinary in scope, like, multi, uh, like marine, spatial, marine spatial plying that kind of try to divide areas to kind of balance the need for conservation and, and kind of our socioeconomic goal. And I mean, all of these things, uh, these conservation missions has, have limitations and, and flaws. Um, and, and definitely recently there's been a push to move away from like strictly spatial and more spatial temporal kind of conservation measure to have more adaptable conservation measure. But kind of the key point that I want to make here is that, you know, to be able to conserve these species, one of the first thing that we need to understand is where are these animal and space and time. And that's kind of what my research group focus on a lot. Sorry. Okay. So my students and I, and you might recognize some familiar faces here, um, are working exactly on this. So a lot of us are developing these statistical methods to try to understand where animals are and, and to help their conservation. So we do things like developing statistical model to understand space use of marine species. Um, we look at methods to get at uh, habitat use to try to understand the critical habitat of species. And in particular, uh, Rowena is looking at ways to include uh, to Additional knowledge from hunters in that process. Um, we work a lot on this understanding the foraging and diving behaviors of species uh, because it's key to understanding where they do their critical behaviors. Um, with a lot of collaborators, we work on things like biodiversity hotspots in the Arctic, so where multiple species congregate, and so that they're kind of important beyond just like one species of interest. Um, because animals are where their food is, we work a lot on now on modeling prey field and understanding how it changes uh, through time or predicted how it's going to change with climate change. And finally, we work on characterizing migration. And kind of under all of these projects that are led by these student and postdoc, there's some pretty nifty statistical methodology. But today, I'll focus only kind of on a subset of this work, which is characterizing migration and the statistical models under, under that part, which are state-space models. So I'll start about talking today, I'll start about talking about state-space models, then I'll talk about how we can use it to infer better tracks of animal of marine animals, and then I'll show kind of an application, so how we use state-space models to look at the migration route of the longest migrants in the world, the Arctic Tern. Then I'll show how we can use state-space model to go and go beyond inferring better tracks to get at uh, the, the hen behavioral process. And then I'll, I'll show again an example where we looked at um, narwhal stop oversight and, and their migrations. Okay, so let's start with state space model. So state space model are incredibly used in fishery science and ecology. Um, they're now used in epidemiology. They're, they're increasingly used in biomedical research and economics. And in particular, they have a really, really long history in the analysis of movement. So the very first application of state space model was to try to recreate the movement path of a space shuttle going to the moon. And, and that was what became the very famous Kalman filter. And that Kalman filter um, uh, uh, was used for all Apollo mission, and it's now used in a lot of navigational system. And it state-space model kind of first application in movement ecology was 30 years later, and it was very, very similar to the, the original space shuttle Kalman filter methodology. So Anderson and Sprecher and the daughter looked at the movement of a mule deer colored with a VHS collar, and they used the Kalman filter to try to recreate where it was exactly. And that was a very fir important first application, but at the same time, in the 90s, GPS technology appeared, which 
kind of meant that we didn't need as much um, state-based model to recreate an accurate track of an animal on land because we could just use a GPS that you know gave us a really accurate location. So it's only really kind of like 10 years later that state-based model became really important in animal movement. And that's because it was used with marine animal that could not be tracked with GPS data. So it was using the same kind of idea where we're trying to recreate where the animal is based on kind of messy data. And then kind of in recent years, we moved beyond just trying to recreate an accurate track and try to get at the HIN process, the HIN behavioral process that the animal is doing using messy data or, or nice data. But the key is kind of we're trying to get at things like, you know, uh, memory or, or, or energy expenditure, et cetera. So I'll talk about this into detail, but the, the one of the key advantage and one of the key reasons why people use state-based model is that they allow you to better predict the true value of a time series. So this is a, a simulation. And so in red here, the little red dots is the kind of the true simulated state of the time series. So, you know, population size or where the animal is. And then in blue is the observation and there's measurement errors, so they're all over the place. And then the black line here is the estimated true location of the animal based on the observation in a state-based model. And then the key point here is that we can see that the estimated location, the black line, is closer to the true simulated value, the red, the red dots, than the, than the observation. And that the confidence interval, so the gray bars, contain the majority, well, 95% of the, of the true state. So that's the key, is that if you use a state-based model that's adequate for your data, you'll, uh, you'll get a better understanding of the underlying process than the observation alone. And that's why they're used a lot. So what are state-based models? So here is kind of a, a general equation or general kind of framework for a state-based model. And one of the key features is that it has at least two equations, a process equation and a measurement equation. And the process equation model the state, so the true value of the time series at time t, and it's divided into two parts. So there's a deterministic function, the f of xt minus 1, that kind of usually describe the behavioral process that we're interested in, so the movement process, for example. And, and the key thing is that it has this autocorrelation. So the state at time t depends on the state at time t minus 1. And then the second part is this process noise. And that's a stochastic part. And really, that accounts for the fact that it's almost impossible to exactly predict where you know the true state of a time series. There's usually something that we can't really know for sure. And that allows for that uncertainty. Then the measurement equation uh, models where the observation is at time t. And, and it uh, also can be divided in two parts. The first, the determinist deterministic part kind of models the observation mechanism. And so it's a function of the true state xt. And that's where you would kind of model any kind of systematic bias in your observation, for example. And then very importantly, it has this measurement error that allows for the fact that, you know, we're not sure exactly how the observation is compared to what the true value is. Uh, so I before I jump there. So one thing, I haven't really described how this, these process noise and these measurement errors are, are, are defined, but for now you can think of them as, you know, coming from two normal distribution, for example. So we can look at this state space model visually. So here the arrows are uh, representing uh, the relationship or the, or the equations. And, um, what we can see is that the process equation models kind of the temporal autocorrelation into the, the process equation, and that, um, and that the measurement equation models the observation based on the true state. And once we're kind of accounting for that temporal autocorrelation, the observation are thought to be independent of one another. So that's kind of conditional independence. And this structure allows us to differentiate between the process noise and the measurement error. And it's part of the reason why we can, you know, get a good estimate of, of the true states. So one of the kind of key advantage of state-space model is that they're incredibly flexible. So the deterministic part, both the, 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 the for the process equation and for the measurement equation, can 
have a variety of form. And I'm showing here a few examples. So, I mean, it can be the, the good old linear form where you have an intercept and, and a slope, but it can have these very complex equation. I mean, there's some limitation to what you can do, but it's incredibly flexible. And the same, same thing goes for the stochastic part. So, I mean, you can use a normal distribution and it definitely simplifies thing if you have a normally distributed process noise and measurement error. But in theory, you can also use a broad range of different type of distribution to model both of these things. So the fact that state space models are incredibly flexible and, um, and, um, and allows you to get at, at, at better kind of estimate of the true values of your time series is the reason why people are drawn to them. But the key thing and kind of the things where thing, the, the, the place where thing gets hard is how do we fit these models to data? So in theory, they can do a lot. And in, in practice, you, you need to understand a little bit how you fit them to data to be able to have good state-space model. Definitely, that's where things get technical. I won't spend too much time on this, but I think it's important to kind of get a, a little bit of an idea of how state-space model will fit to data. So the first thing is that you can fit state-space model in a frequentist and in a Bayesian framework. And I think some people are under the impression that you can only fit complex state-space model with a Bayesian framework. And that was definitely true, you know, 10, 20 years ago, but that's no longer true. Now you can, you, you can fit complex state-space model with a frequentist or a Bayesian framework. And really the choice between the two is a philosophical one um, or one associated kind of with uh, implementation or tools that are available to you. And I use both approaches, uh, but today I'm just going to explain kind of the, the ideas behind fitting state-space model using the frequentist framework because I, I find it easier. Okay, so the key thing with um, fitting state-space model, at least in, a, in the frequentist framework, is that there's kind of two different things that you have to estimate. There's the state, so the true value of the time series, the estimated true value of the time series, and the parameters. So the things that go inside your function. So the, you know, the, the, the intercept and the slope, and you know, the variance of your normal distribution, for example. And these are kind of different beasts, especially in, um, in a frequentist framework. So let's first start with, um, assuming that we know the parameters and we're just trying to estimate the states. And I'll kind of explain how this process work with a tool that is called particle filter. Particle filter is by no means the best way to fit all state space model, but I find it kind of intuitive. So I, I'm going to use it here. So here we have a very silly toy time series. The black dots are um, the observation. Um, and here we're going to assume that the very first observation is the actual state. So for time zero, we know the true states. And then how our particle filter works is that it uses the process equation to kind of propose possible value for the next time step. So given that we know the true value at time zero, where could we be at the next time step? And this is just a simulation. So we have a normal distribution, say we pick a random value from a normal distribution, we use our model here, and we kind of have a, a set of different proposal values, right? Which will change every time you run that simulation. Then you use the measurement equation to kind of assess how likely each of these proposed values are. So here, based on this measurement, equation, it would say that, you know, the proposed value that are closer to the observation are more likely than those that are further away, right? And that's what the, the kind of the shading of the pink is representing. Then using these weights, we're going to select which of these proposed value we're going to propagate, which of those we're going to take and continue forward with. So, I mean, so, sorry, I should say, so those that, you know, have a higher probability, a higher weight will be more likely to be propagated than those that are further away, but this is a random process. So there's still a chance that those are, that are further away might be selected. So we're going to select these, then we're going to use the process equation to propose value for the next time steps. And, and that's what these propose value. And then you can see here, we've kind of selected twice from the one that was very likely. And then by chance alone, we had one, one that was from one that was less likely than the other. And then we do the same thing. We use the measurement equation to weight how likely these, you know, proposed value are at the next time step. Um, and then we select from them based on the weight 
uh, of the, the measurement equation. And then we use the process equation to go forward, et cetera, et cetera. And then we do this for the whole time series. And then we end up with this. This is clearly you would do this like you would have thousands of proposed value at each time step and you would have a much longer time series. But hopefully you kind of get the idea. And then, the, and then here you have kind of these weighted values, weighted proposal values, and you can do a weighted average which is what this red line is represented here. And this weighted average gives you um, your estimate of the true state, right? So it's, it's weighting more, you know, values that are closer to the observation than those are further away. And that would be your, estimated of the, your estimate of the true state. And so this is one way to fit those state space model. It's one specific type of a particle filter. Um, but this idea, this recursive idea comes up in a lot of different methodologies. So for example, the Kalman filter does exactly, well, does something very similar where it proposed value for the next time step, then update based on the measurement equation, then use the process equation to propose some kind of quantify the next possible value, then use the measurement equation. But it does it analytically as opposed to using simulation. Okay. So that's hopefully that was you know a little bit clearer. If not, it's okay. It's a technical part. Um, the other kind of technical part is how do we estimate the parameters? So, I mean, in ecology, in general, we don't actually know the parameters, you know, of the, the two equations. So we can't just estimate the state. We also have to estimate the parameters. And it, that makes fitting state-space model much harder than, say, the first implementations, like the Kalman filter for a space shuttle. So this is a, a likelihood function for kind of a general state-space model. And, um, and that likelihood function is uh, written based on our two equations, or a process equation and a measurement equation. So this part here gives you the probability of your observation given your true state and your parameters theta. So that's based on the measurement equation. And then this part here gives you the probability of the states given the parameters, and it's going to be on the, based on the process equation. And so overall, this gives you kind of the probability of the data given your model and your parameters. And when you estimate parameters in, in a likelihood framework, what you often do is you try to find the parameters that maximize the likelihood, right? A process that we call maximum likelihood estimation. And you might have seen this in a variety of contexts. Kind of the issue with state space model, though, is that you have, you usually use what is called the marginal likelihood. And that means that you integrate over all uh, possible true values, so all possible true location. And, and if you remember anything from your calculus class is that, you know, high dimensional integrals are really not fun to deal with. And in many ways, kind of the difficulty of fitting state-space model and kind of all of the different methods that are available out there kind of has to deal with that quirky and difficult integration. So um, there's a variety of ways to, uh, to fit the, to kind of handle this uh, integration. And, and you can kind of divide it into two parts. There's analytical solution and then there's approximations. Um, and uh, uh, like the kind of the most common analytical solution is that Kalman filter that was used for the space shuttle. And it's, it's super fast and it's exact. So it's really quite good to use. But the issue is that it's only good for simple state space models. So for models that are linear and that has a normal distribution for the process and the measurement equation or, or close to it. Then there's tons of approximation methods that can kind of be divided into two sub categories, some that are simulation based so that use these kind of things like the particle filter to try to get at the integral. They use the weight to kind of get at the integral. And then there's things that use mathematical tricks like the Laplace Class approximation, um, which kind of locally approximate that integral. And then the advantage of the simulation-based method is that they're incredibly flexible. So as long as you can simulate your process equation, sky's the limit. I mean, not really, but kind of sky's the limit. You can simulate whatever you want. Um, but the issue is that, you know, it can be incredibly slow because you have to simulate, you know, thousands of particles for a really long time series that can take days, sometimes weeks. Um, the Laplace approximation is fast and it's semi-flexible. So it's way more flexible than the Camel filter, but it's not as flexible as the simulation-based method. So it's assuming that it's, you know, 
can be locally approximated with a normal distribution, for example. So that means that it's really hard to handle categorical states, for example. It means that um, it can't, the state has to be unimodal, so you can't have something that has kind of two peaks and probability, et cetera. So I use a lot, and I'll talk about a, a, method, a method that I use a lot that's based on the Laplace approximation. It's quite useful, but it's not as flexible as a simulation. And I'll make that pitch a little bit later, but I've just, uh, with a bunch of super co-author, I just wrote a, a review of state space model that talks about kind of these different methodologies to fit state space model. And if you're interested, I think it's, I hope it's a good starting point to kind of help you choose which method you should use for your own model. So let's move a little bit away from the super technical stuff. And I'm going to uh, try to explain how we can use the state space model to infer better animal tracks. So increasingly, ecologists um, are tracking animals. So they're catching the animal they're interested in and placing some kind of tag on them to see where they are in, in space through time. And these tags come in different shapes and form. But the issue with marine species is that uh, the data, the marine data, is usually super error prone. So uh, for example, Argos data, which one, was one of the first type of data state space model were developed for have errors that range from you know just four kilometers to you know 40 kilometers and and that kind of error can really impact our understanding of animal movement so for example the strings here here it looks like it's going from you know Canada to Greenland in a few hours which is quite unlikely the issue the kind of additional issue is that Argos data is only available for um, for species that come to the surface. Um, and so for a lot of species like fish, I promised some fish, uh, a lot of species like fish, you have to rely on other technology that's worse than Argos data. So for example, light-based geolocation, which has error around 200 kilometers. So for example, this is an Atlantic salmon in Newfoundland, and you can see that it looks like the, you know, the fish cross Newfoundland in, in, in two days, which is pretty unlikely since Newfoundland is about 650 kilometer across and, you know, fish don't walk on land. So with that kind of measurement error, it's hard to answer even the most basic questions. And that's why we need these state space models. So the idea behind these state space model is that, you know, even though it may feel hard to predict where an animal is at time t based on where it was at time t minus one, because, you know, they have to handle tons of things like where the food is and where the predator are, you can usually make these very simple probabilistic models that says, okay, the animal is going to be close to where it was before and, you know, may move in the same direction. And so you can kind of, the blue, the darker blue here says it's more likely to be here based on how it was moving before. And then what the state space model will do is do an additional kind of probabilistic model that says, okay, given where we think the animal actually is, where are we likely to observe it? And we're going to say that it's closer, we're likely to observe it closer to where it actually is, but there's a range of value, which is what that, this pink circle is, is representing. There's a range of value where it's probable to see the animal. So here the observation falls within that, that range. So using those data and these kind of two simple probabilistic model, we can estimate the true location, which is not going to be exactly on where, not going to be exactly where the animal was, but should be closer than the observation. Okay, so I'll explain a simple, a, like a, a simplified version of one of the very first movement state space model to kind of give you a, a concrete feel of how they, they work. And this was developed by Ian Johnson um, uh, many years ago now. Um, and so here we have the process equation and the process equation says that the animal at time t is going to be close to where the animal is at time t minus one. And in addition, that uh, the movement is going to be dependent on the movement that it was doing at uh, between time t minus 1 and time t minus 2. So here what the gamma does, so let's say the gamma is close to 1. What this part does is says, okay, the animal is more likely to move in the same direction at the same speed. And then the, the, the error here allows for, you know, the true state to not be exactly where the deterministic part would, um, would predict. So this would be a normal distribution. Um, now, the measurement equation kind of handles the peculiarities of the observation. So here we're using Argos data. That's quite complex. It's irregular. It's collected at irregular time step. Um, those irregular time steps are um, indexed by I. Um, and, and 
the 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 process equation though models the 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 location of the animal at regular time step that are indexed by t. And what this kind of equation does, which this part does, is just kind of explain that between two regular time step, we're assuming that the animal moves in a straight line. And we link you know, the observation to the true location by assuming that the animal is going to be on that straight line. And we use the time of the observation compared to the the, the regular time interval to kind of see where it's going to be on that line. And then based on this, we're going to add an error distribution that's going to allow the animal, the observation not to be exactly where the animal is, but a little bit further away. And in this case, you know, Argos data is complicated. It has multiple quality ratings. It, it has large outliers. So the, 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 there's multiple different distribution that we use, but those are kind of details. Okay. So um, hopefully that kind of makes sense. Um, so the, the one thing though with state-space model is that uh, they're incredibly useful, but they're very hard to validate. And because we usually use state-space model when we don't know or we don't have any data on the true location and when there's lots of measurement errors. So a few years ago, I took advantage of the fact that I had this kind of rare data set for polar bears where I had both Argos and GPS data. So I had this, this messy measurement data and I could use this messy Argos data to try to estimate the true location of the bear. And then I could compare it to the GPS uh, data to see how accurate is that estimate. So kind of answer like how good are these state space model for, for animal movement. So here's one example. Um, this is the track of one polar bear. The gray is the Argos data, and you can see it's all over the place. And then the red is the estimated true location from the state space model. And then the black circle are the GPS location. And we can see that this um, state space model does incredibly well. So most, you know, um, estimated true location overlap with the GPS location. So if you have, you know, a model that's good for your data set, um, it's going to do very well. And that and that was, you know, actually quite surprising at the time. Uh, I, being slightly pessimistic uh, in life, I, I was sure that it would do bad, but it turned out to do pretty good. And it's kind of only a few years later that I realized one of the reason why it's doing so well. I mean, the state space model is doing well, but there's kind of a specific thing about that data set that helps it. So this is the same track. Um, and, but I'm going to focus here just on a little part of that track. So we're seeing the longitude and the latitude here. And one of the key things that I want you to see is that we can see the dots here are the observation. We can see that the observation are clustered in time. So we see like there's a bunch of Argos location, then there's a gap, then there's a bunch, then there's a gap, then there's a bunch, then there's a gap. And a lot of ecologists or a lot of researchers might think that this is a disadvantage because it means that you don't have data in between. But actually, that is the key reason why the state space model is doing so well on this data set is that we have replicate observation and those replicate observation are allowing the state space model to estimate the error really well. And in fact, when I talk about state space model to, to a bunch of people, people always tell me, why don't you just you know, drop the bad location. We have quality rating on these Argos, you know, data. Why don't you just drop the bad location and use the best, you know, quality observation per day? Um, and the reason is that doing that, you remove that replication that's so important. So here, for example, we see the best quality location in, in black and we see the, the, um, the, all the other observation in gray. And if we fit the state space model to all the observation or just the best location, we can see that when you use all the observation, the difference between the estimated location and the, G and the truth, the GPS location, is smaller than when you use the best observation. Um, so actually, using that bad data, though it seemed counterintuitive, helps your model. And I mean, I, I've removed some of the, the extra slide, but you can also see it kind of in the performance of the model, like the likelihood function look, the likelihood profiles look really ugly when you use only the best 
observation. And I mean, this is for animal movement data, but it's true for all state-based model. And actually there was work um, by others a few years ago that showed that for, for example, for population dynamics, state-based model on um, in the t terrestrial world, it was advantage to say, do, you know, multiple surveys every three years, you would get a better estimate of, you know, the population size and the trend in the population than doing a survey every year. Because that replication, when you have lots of measurement error, is really key to get a good estimate of the, of the measurement error. Okay, so, the other thing that, you know, I mean, it's a few years ago now, but the other thing is that kind of when I started working a lot on state space model, a lot of the complex model that seemed more realistic for animal movement data seemed to be only uh, fitable with um, Bayesian methods and simulation based methods like using tools like JAGS. And at that time, there was kind of the development of a new R package called TMB that uh, used this Laplace approximation to uh, kind of deal with the integral and allow you to fit the similar types of state space model, but faster. So one of the things that I looked at is I use, you know, I developed the same state space model in TMB and JAGS and um, fit it to the same data and kind of compare the results. So that's what we're seeing here. This is the same track, the estimated values in, in red and in blue, and then the GPS. And we can see, you know, they both do very well. Actually, JAGS is a tiny little bit better, mar very marginally, but they do very well. But the key difference is that, you know, TAB took less than a minute, while JAG took, you know, more than 35 minutes. And that might seem inconsequential, but this is just one track of polar bears. And truth, that data set has, you know, 60 to 100 polar bears. So, I mean, we're talking about, you know, taking an hour versus taking days. And kind of being able to use these fast fitting method allow us to, um, to develop and kind of think about tons of different types of model because we could develop them and test them, which was much harder with JAGS just because it would take so much longer to kind of assess different ideas that we had for models. So one a key thing that we did with, uh, with this new technology is kind of trying to incorporate different data stream to improve our model for light-based geolocation data. So uh, for this Atlantic salmon that I talked before that was followed with this light-based uh, geolocator, we also had detection data. And detection data is like a little tag that you implant in the fish that kind of gives a ping like this is number three, three, fish three, three, one. And then when they come close to a receiver, which are these black things, the receiver take a note of like, okay, fish three, three, one was here, you know, Wednesday at 9.30. Um, and in Newfoundland, there's a kind of a, a wide array of acoustic receiver, um, which is what we see here. And we wanted to use, we wanted to kind of integrate that data in our state space model. So we've developed tons of different ways to integrate the data and this is something that I'm still working on it's very much so work in progress um, but the key idea is that we have our kind of base state space model for the light based geolocation data very similar to the one that I just talked about and then we have different ways to incorporate detection data I'll just kind of mention one and um, so this model for detection data uh, models the, the the distance between you know, the detection, so the location of the receiver and the true location of the animal based on our light-based geolocation state space model as a function of the time between the detection and the predicted value of the state. So the idea is that if we're predicting where the animal is at, you know, one o'clock each day and the detection was at noon, we're assuming that the fish is no longer on the, the receiver, if not, you would have a detection at one, but the fish has moved away. And we're using a truncated normal distribution where the peak, the mean of the distribution is a function of that time interval, the, the, the time difference between the detection and when we predict the true location and the speed of the animal. And so it's kind of like a growing donut as the time difference increases. So I always do simulations to kind of test out that my model do what they should do. So this is a, a, a kind of a simple simulation. So we have in black the simulated true location of the fish, the gray is the Argos, uh, sorry, the light-based geolocation data, the blue is the 
detection data. And in red here, we're seeing the estimated true location based on the model that has the detection, that uses the detection information, and then we have the true location with a model that does not um, use the detection. And I mean, unsurprisingly, um, you do better when you use a detection data because it's just additional information. Um, and kind of an additional note is that you do better at predicting where the animal is, um, but you also do better in your estimate of the parameters. So it helps kind of overall the model because it adds this kind of additional data. So, um, so we fitted it to the Atlantic salmon data. And again, this is very much so work in progress. This is not the final model, but the kind of the key point here is so we have the, 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 tr the estimated track of the fish using detection and not detection data. And the key point is when we look at bays where we have a lot of detection data, when we use that information, we, you know, capture the fact that the fish spends, you know, actually weeks in these little bays when the original model on light based relocation would completely ignore that information. And now we're working on tons of things like land mask and incorporating dive data, et cetera, et cetera. But um, it was just kind of showing ways to, you can expand these state space model to have better uh, prediction. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to just an application. So now that we know how we can, you know, do, create these state space model, what can we do with them? So this is the work of uh, Joanna Wong, um, who just defended her thesis here at the AOF uh, last month. Um, and she was working on Arctic Tern um, from five different colonies, from Alaska to uh, Nova Scotia. And they were tagged with these light-based geolocators, so similar to the fish data. Uh, and these light-based geolocator had kind of two, inf well, these tags had two different information. So they have light intensity that can be used for getting at latitude longitude with a kind of internal clock. And then they have temperature. So every time the little, you know, bird put its leg in the water, you get a temperature reading and then you can match that temperature reading with like models of sea surface temperature, like based on like um, satellite imagery. And um, you can use this two types of information in a state space model to try to predict where they are. And this model is very different from the one that um, I showed you before, and it was developed by Simon Lizovsky, but it's, it's a state space model regardless. And what Joanna used that uh, information to do is to show that, you know, these five different colonies, you know, that are kind of across North America, um, are using only three routes to three uh, coastal routes to do their southbound migration to Antarctica and are using two common routes, um, oceanic common routes to, to, to come back to do the northbound migration. And she did a literature review and showed that um, the, um, you know, the routes that we saw for our colonies are the same routes that have been described by, you know, Arctic terns from different colonies. And that for conservation is important because it says that, you know, if something happened on this route, it's impacting, you know, a really large part of the population of Arctic tern. And then she also looked at, you know, different other transoceanic uh, seabird species, and many of them seem to, you know, share these roots. And in the uh, avian conservation world, there's this concept of um, flyaways, which are these kind of multi-species um, roots um, that are thought to be important to, to information to use to conserve a broad range of species. And the thing is that there's no flyaways for seabirds. And kind of the next best thing that we could look at was water bird flyaways. I mean, Arctic terns are not water birds, but it was just kind of the best thing we could look at. And kind of unsurprisingly, um, we saw that the roots of our, of our birds were not you know, part of the water birds flyaways, They're, they would also not be part of the terrestrial flyaways. So kind of the key point that we're making here is I think it's time to create these seabird flyaways, look at a broad range of seabird species beyond Arctic Tern and see what are the main multi-species routes. And um, 
and I mean, one thing I want to note here is that we're not saying that, you know, you have to conserve all of these flowerways at all time. This would cover the entire world, like nothing could be done nowhere. But the idea is that, you know, these flyaways for these long distance migrants connect the countries that kind of share the conservation burden or the management burden of a bunch of birds. So the idea is that, you know, you can then, you know, connect Canada to the US to whatever other country that it should kind of manage together a bunch of, of species. Okay, so now I'll kind of switch and talk about where how we can go beyond uh, inferring better track and get hidden processes. So the concept is the same. So for the state space model, so we're using these observation here, we're going to assume that they're good observations, say GPS data. And to try to infer something that we don't see well. So here the, the behavior, and we're assuming that the behavior are clustered in time. And that makes sense because often we know that animals will, you know, forage in an area for a little while before continuing on. And the idea is that, you know, this underlying behavior, whether it's foraging uh, or transiting is gonna affect the movement behavior. So, I mean, when they're foraging, they might be slower and, and kind of move, turn around more than when they're transiting. So, the state space model is going to be similar in that you're going to have two different equations. And here, what we're going to do is going to, we're going to move the process equation and it's going to become the measurement equation. Because we're assuming that we know where the animal is. And so this is kind of describing the, the movement. And the key here is instead of having one gamma, remember that gamma was kind of predicting, kind of showing how the animal was moving in comparison to the previous time step. Now we're going to have a gamma that changes through time. Um, and this is going to, you know, have this autocorrelation. So the gamma at time t is going to be depending on the gamma at time t minus one, and it's going to be a logit function. And there's tons of other detail just because this has to be between zero and one. But the key is that, you know, as gamma changes from zero to one, it changes. Uh, oh my goodness! Sorry, guys. I have a, <laughs> an Adobe. Uh, Okay, do you see? okay, so that uh, I oh my goodness. Okay, that as the gamma changes through time, um, the um, okay, sorry, I've got totally sidetracked by some random update. Okay, uh, so as the gamma changes through time, it changes the movement of the animal. So when gamma is close to zero, the animal will do, do this more torturous movement. And when the gamma is close to one, it's going to do this more directed movement. And so here's an example on um, gray seals. So they're moving from Sable Island here. And you can see like the the when the line are thinner, that's, you know, uh, when the gamma is close to, to one, where it's doing this more directed movement. And when the line is thicker is when it's close to zero. And you can clearly see that this, you know, seal is going back and forth from the island to this foraging spot. And kind of the fun thing um, is that you can change this kind of simple autocorrelation to include covariates, environmental covariates. So, for example, sea surface temperature. Um, and um, so here, this is work led by other uh, co-authors. So Ian Johnson looked at how you could incorporate things like ice and chlorophyll A to look at what affected where these animal uh, foraged. And um, Joseph Esaguirre looked at how you could look at thermal uplift to see where on the migration route these golden eagle would stop. And then kind of just to end, I realize we're almost out of time. Um, we're going to look at um, uh, uh, how, how we use this with narwhals. So this is led by Courtney Stewart, who's a postdoc here. And she's working with WWF and a bunch of people. And she's looking at the, mar the migration of narwhals um, along Baffin Island. And they go from these summering uh, ground to these wintering ground every year. And we're using our ghost tags. And what she saw is that there's kind of two different uh, uh, route, migration route, the offshore and the near shore, and she could use this kind of gamma to differentiate where the animals are doing this kind of directed movement and when they're stopping over. And that's important for conservation. So for example, for the near shore, we're seeing that they're stopping in these area, which are actually kind of deep, deep canyons, um, uh, which we think is where the fish are. <laughs> 
And then she also used this gamma to kind of identify when they're starting their migration. So when they're kind of, the gamma is closer to one, when it starts being closer to one is the start of their migration. And she sh showed that through time, the, the narwhals are changing their migration. So their migration phenology has changed. So in, in earlier years, in the 90s, they were kind of starting to migrate earlier than they are now. And that change kind of matches with changes in climate change. So there's an increase about 10 days per decade, which is about an increase in the days between the ice breakup. So they seem to be keeping up with the ice around them. And kind of for conservation, the key is that here there's a new mine and there's increased shipping. So by staying more in that area, they kind of more likely to be impacted by the shipping. And we know that they're incredibly sensitive to, to shipping noise. And that's it. So I hope kind of what I hope that you got from this is that state space models are incredibly useful for um, for animal movement um, and that there's a lot that you can do. Um, these were just kind of a few example, but really state space models are incredibly useful in ecology and in, in, in fishery science and for time series in general. And this is a very shameless um, pitch, but I just wrote uh, with a bunch of co-authors, this um, uh, review on state-space model for ecological time series, not just for animal movement, uh, that is available now as a preprint on ArchiveX, which is really, I wrote it thinking a lot about students and students wanting to use state-space model. And I, th and I hope that it's kind of a really good guide to kind of start wrapping your head around these really difficult models. And in particular, there's this appendix here that has hundreds of page of tutorials of how to fit these state-space model in R using a broad range of tools. So using, you know, JAG, STAN, TMB, Nimble. So kind of giving you the tools, hopefully, to fit these models and importantly to validate these models because you know I've kind of showed the glossy part of state space model but they they are tricky to fit to data so please take a look if you're interested in state space model and with this I want to thank I mean you for your attention I know this is a technical talk um so I appreciate the attention all of my student and postdoc and the tons and tons of collaborators and funders that help with this uh, work and I'll take questions Great, thanks a lot for a really excellent and informative talk, Marie. Um, I think there was at least one student who had a question. <laughs> we, she identified herself at the beginning. I think it's Katie. Hi, it's me. <laughs> thanks for the great talk, Marie. Um, I'm wondering what types of methodological improvements and stuff that you think would be most useful for state space models. Well, so. Okay, so I think personally, the kind of thing that I'm the most interested in currently, so I might have, you know, some, some bias in that answer is to look at how you can validate it. So there are, you know, a few recent methodology that looked at, um, you know, uh, one step ahead residuals. So it's kind of, you know, when we do a linear regression, we have tons of tools to look at whether our model is okay. Right, and with state-space model, it's much harder to achieve because they're harder and com more complex models. And there are increasingly tools that are available to do that, but not that many. So definitely looking at more ways to validate. I think thinking about cross-validation and a way to implement it um, efficiently would be really great. And that's definitely something I is on my, you know, top of my to-do list. Um, but there's tons of 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 other, yeah, other things to do. But I think that's kind of number one in my mind. Mike has a question, Mike Melnichuk. Hi, that was a great talk, thank you. Uh, for the particle-based method that you talked about, the recursive method, um, that has a clear utility in terms of being able to make predictions one or two time steps ahead. For mm -hmm. other kinds of studies though, where you're interested in inference and just analyzing a historical time series, is the recursive part of that necessary or are there advantages to simultaneously considering the entire time series all at once and analyzing that fill in the state space framework, but yeah. without the tendency of each recursion. Yeah, I mean, um, 
so I mean, I kind of brushed over that very quickly. I mean, so in like state space modeling framework, there's kind of three different ways of predicting the states. There's filtering, smoothing, and predicting. And I've kind of showed, um, you know, the predicting. So that means that you, you know, you estimate, uh, I showed filtering. So you estimate the state based on a time series up to that time step. So every time you have a new point, you kind of add that that value. And that's what the Kalman filter was because it was an online algorithm for that space shuttle. But you can definitely use the same idea for smoothing where you use the entire time series. And even some of the you know recursive algorithm are used in these smoothing algorithms. So you might have a forward and a backward, for example, algorithm that are put together to use the entire time series. But some of kind of the main idea where you're using, um, you know, the process equation to kind of get an idea of what, where things would be, and then use the measurement e equation to update is useful in a bunch of different methodology, even if you use the entire time series. So particle filters, for example, are used with an entire time series all the time, like to fit the parameters and to fit the estimate for the, even using all of your data points. I'm not okay. sure if that made sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. Thank you. There's a question from Sam Chep Cheplik. Yes, um, so going back to when you kind of discussed the uh, measurement errors in the beginning, I was just curious how uh, maybe applying circuit scape or circuit theory could be um, advantageous um, to kind of capturing that. You're going to have to tell me more. I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I'm not sure I know enough about circuit theory to, to know. Tell me a little bit about it. Um, actually, uh, in, in another question, um, I was just curious what applications there have been, if, if you know of circuit scape in terms of uh, like fish populations, because um, I wasn't really familiar. Um, other than more avian or terrestrial? I'm not sure. I'm not, I don't know about circuitscape. I, I've heard the term, but I've no real understanding how it works. So I don't think I can answer the question. I'm sorry. I'll look into it though. <laughs> Thanks. All right, I, just a question on uh, how you choose uh, between different models, like you mentioned instances where covariates are used uh, to predict uh, movements and so on. And uh, there can be a whole variety of different types of covariates that could be used. Like uh, these models are a lot more complex and uh, take a lot longer to run. Um, and uh, so what are your, what, what sort of guidance uh, can you provide on straightforward approaches to model selection when you have a bunch of different candidate models <coughs> that uh, seem to be okay, but uh, you know, what, what sort of approaches do you apply for model selection in, with your modeling? space modeling yeah so i mean i think the 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 gold standard would be cross validation um but cross validation is challenging to apply with state space model in general with complex model um it's quite hard because you need to fit the model kind of without a piece of the data and so you have to fit the model multiple times so if you're fitting models in in jags or using mcmc for example a simulation based method that will take a lot of time because you're going to refit the model over and over again. But definitely cross-validation is, I think, the gold standard. Um, then there's tons of approximation. Um, and it depends a little bit of which framework you're in, like if you're a Bayesian or a, or a frequentist. Uh, you can use AIC to select between models. I mean, there's definitely issues with using AIC in that, you know, the state-based model use the marginal likelihood. And, and so we're not sure of like the exact degrees of freedom that like the exact penalty that we should apply. But if you're, you know, in many cases, the kind of the bias of not knowing that will be the same across your, like if you're just comparing covariates, the, the bias will be the same. So you can use AIC to compare models. If you're Bayesian, you can use the equivalent. So there's like WAIC, for example, that can can be used. And a lot of packages are increasingly allowing like to calculate WAIC really easily with these kind of state-based model or, 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 or hierarchical models. Generally, I think there's issue around those, but it becomes kind of technical. 
Um, and then, and yeah, so there's, there's the, I think the gold standard is cross validation. If that's not possible, then you can use some of the tools that you use for other models like AIC and WAIC. Um, cross validation is, uh, using the data, uh, different components of the data, like, uh, slices in the data, but, um, you also mentioned simulation testing, like, uh, isn't that better? Cause you, you seem, you understand here's hypotheses about how the data are generated and then you just apply your method to see how well it, it, it recovers uh, correctly and without bias and so on. Isn't that? Oh, oh, absolutely. Bit? So I, I always do a, I mean, that's me, but I always do a simulation study just to check that you, and that would be to check kind of for, you know, things like ident, like identifiability problems. So just kind of to check that the model itself, if it has perfect data, is capable of recovering it. And there are instances that you, you know, with a simulation, you'll realize that your model will never be able to spit back what you want it to be. So if you have parameter identifiability problem, for example, so your model is too complex for your data and it's just never going to work, right? Um, so that's absolutely simulation. To me, simulation are really important. I do it all the time. Um, but that's kind of like a sanity check, like does the model work in theory? Then if you want to compare it to, you know, if you want to choose between different models that could work in theory with your data set, that's when cross-validation and AIC and WAIC would come in. And I think kind of for the sanity check too, it's good to look at things, you know, Katie was asking what I think is most important. It's good at looking at things like uh, one step ahead residuals and looking at that your assumption of your models are being met and that things seems to to check in. Thanks. Katie has another question. Yeah. Um, what are the advantages of or in what scenarios would you use a hidden markup model instead of a state space model to estimate behavior? So a hidden markup model is a state space model. Um, so, I mean, some people see things differently, but I see a hidden mark of models as a type of state space model where the state is discrete as opposed to continuous. Um, so the, it has exactly the same st structure. It's just that you have your X's and your models are, you know, categorical values and a hidden mark of models are easier to fit to data. Like if you have a, just a plain hidden Markov model, there's tons of really good analytical, like really good algorithm that allows you to fit hidden Markov models super quickly and super well. Um, so if you have, you know, GPS data or really good data and you just want to get at categorical values underneath, you're better to use, well, not you're better, but it's just easier and more um, appropriate to use a hidden Markov model is just going to simplify your life. And um, if your uh, if your data is if your state is continuous, then by definition you have to go state space model, which is just kind of the broader term for these hierarchical models for time series. Um, and it, it 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 can be more complex. And then there's kind of like this other layers that you can have a, a hidden Markov model nested within a state space model. So, I mean, I've always talked about just two equations, but you know, they're, they're um, state space model that have multiple levels. So you kind of have your, you know, your observation. So let's think about, since you work on seal with Argos data, um, let's think about, uh, you know, you have your Argos kind of model that's kind of dealing with the measurement error of the Argos. And then there's an equation that says where the animal is. And then there's an equation that says, okay, how does the gamma changes? Um, and that kind of defines uh, the behavior. And that could be continuous, like the one I showed, but it could also be discrete. So for example, Ian Johnson's like BSAM model is one of those hierarchical model where there's a hen, there's a hen mark of model nested within a state space model. You're using a two-step okay. approach, though. Yeah. 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 I always wondered, like, why why would you do a discrete state if you could do a continuous? But I guess simplicity. Well, sense. yeah, but also the continuous state, really, you can just go from, like, zero to one, in our case. And, uh, like, in a hidden Markov model, you could have uh, more than – that. you could have, like, different types of uh, – behavior that affects different parts 
of um of the movement we can talk about it more in detail but like think about like some of the work from the other students in the lab where you know one one uh one state affects the step length and one state effect state affect a turning angle and this would be hard to achieve with a continuous state uh model okay gotcha thank you no problem so <clears throat> there's st i see still a bunch of graduate students there chance to answer, ask a few more questions it's a smaller friendlier audience no, I had just one question um, about uh, Bayesian versus uh, the frequentist approaches. And uh, it appears like where you have a lot of data, it doesn't seem like there's a lot much difference, except it takes longer perhaps to run the Bayesian methods because of the algorithms. Um, but uh, let's say stated advantage of Bayesian when you don't have uh, a lot of data, uh, great data, like or high quality data, like where you have arg really fuzzy, uh, imprecise Argos locations, is that you can uh, develop priors uh, and uh, uh, if as long as they're reasonably developed then you there's an advantage um, but uh, I'd be just curious about uh, your views on uh, potential advantages are there no advantages of Bayesian approaches in 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 uh, the sort of state space modeling that uh, you're doing or, or do you do you see some instances where there are some distinct advantages and how do you actually develop priors uh, that are not just like uh, non-informed priors like when you're considering priors for state space modeling. Well, so, I mean, I think the, the main advantage is exactly that, is the, if you have, you know, informative, if you have information that can create priors and, and Rowena that's here on the call and a PhD student, I mean, is kind of looking at that exactly and that she's, she's using traditional knowledge to create these kind of priors to inform our models. And it's particularly useful, or we, we expect it to be particularly useful for like species where we have very little movement data, yet, you know, this like vast amount of information on the species like held in you know the hunter's mind right and in the, in the tk so i think and you can see it in in many different ways you know experts or whatever might have you know fish like fishers might have this very good information on where you know species do spend their time to forage and you can incorporate that in your priors how to create those priors you would have to these are very informative priors uh, you would have to ask rowena and maybe joe that's also on the call uh, about kind of the more specific and i think that's a big part of kind of what they're going to be working on is kind of the interest of their of, of some of their work um but there's other advantage to Bayesian methodology beyond kind of priors i mean there's uh, you know, in, in many ways, Bayesian methods get more at what we want. Like when we fit different models, we want the probability of the models given the data, not the probability of the data given the models. At least some of us kind of want that. And that's what Bayesian models do. Um, and also, I think another advantage is that often they they kind of provide a better sense of uh, kind of the overall uncertainty. Like the posteriors are quite useful is what I'm trying to get at. The posteriors are quite useful things to look at and they give you a lot of information that you may not get from just your confidence interval in a frequentist framework. So I think there are like just fundamental differences between the the Bayesian and the frequentist framework, and there's reason to use each one of them depending on your kind of question at hand and 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 data at hand. I think you know the issue is that some of the frequentist method that are fast, like TMB or NDM ADMB, like the the, the previous version of it, um, is that they're they, they're not as flexible as, like it only works for a subset of models um, that you, to be able to fit those in a frequentist framework, you're gonna have to use a simulation-based method and then and then the frequentist method is gonna be as slow as the Bayesian method. So, I mean, there's definitely instances where, you know, the frequentist method is not gonna be faster than the Bayesian method. Okay, thanks a lot, Mary. That was really terrific. Really enjoyed your talk. That's excellent. So 
Thanks, Kate. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all for the later. questions.